mind of Noah to hear the words of God tell him that all flesh is going to be destroyed. All flesh. All these neighbors, all these friends, all of those who refuse the safety of what God was going to provide, gone. All animal life, all air-breathing creatures, gone. God brought that message to this dear man, Noah. But we're reminded that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God had more than a plan of judgment. He had a plan of deliverance. He had a plan of salvation. He had a plan of rescuing those who would turn to him. You would have anticipated that there would have been many who said, a flood coming? We're going to all die? That's the message you're preaching, Noah? We'll believe you. We would rather take that leap of faith as we see it and trust in the living God than to die from the face of the earth. But God had a great, great plan. What must it have been like to be part of God's plan of grace? Yes, God's judgment was going to fall. But to know that God was going to do something that would provide for the salvation of all who would believe. And in order to preserve life, in order to preserve human life, in order to preserve terrestrial animal life on earth, God gave a command to Noah. And the command that he gave to him was this, I want you to build a huge barge-like structure called an ark. And that's going to be the provision that will save mankind. And so according to God's instructions, because there is a coming flood and there is destruction that is coming upon the face of the earth, any who would be saved must be occupants of this ark. And it was to be designed by God's instructions for the capability of its capacity and of its floating stability. It was to be a place of safety. It was to be the provision of deliverance from death, but it was to be the provision as well for the sustenance of life in the time that that flood would be upon the earth. So what God instructs Noah to do is to build a floating rectangular box and get in it and bring two of each of the kind of life upon earth and there you will stay in safety. We think about the ark. How many of you have been to Kentucky and seen the ark that has been the replica of the ark? Ah, some of you have been there. It's impressive, isn't it? Huge! You look at that as you walk from the parking lot toward it and you say, my word, I didn't realize how big the ark was. It was, it was a d dimensions that, that are strange to us too because the dimensions are given in cubits. It was the common unit of measurement among the Babylonians, among the Egyptians, among the Hebrews, and there were at least two kinds of cubits that were known. There was the common cubit, which was shorter, and there was the royal cubit. The royal cubit was a hand breadth longer than the common cubit. And the royal cubit reached from the point of your elbow to the tip of the middle finger, which usually it is discovered, transformed into our common measurement, is almost 18 or about 18 inches, anywhere from 18 to 21 inches. 18 inches has been the common cubit or the royal cubit that has been accepted. And so if we're looking at the dimensions of the ark, put on your thinking caps, uh, you have uh, a length of 300 cubits. 
So you have 300 plus 150, which is 450 feet. You have a width of 50 cubits, which is 50 plus 25 gives you 75 feet. And you have a height of 30 cubits, so you have 30 plus 15, 45. So you have this box that is to be prepared, a place of safety, a place of provision. So when we imagine it, don't think of some little ship that was constructed, but think in terms of the bigness of what God was providing. Now our auditorium is 50 feet by 40 feet. The building, not looking up all the way to the top of the roof perhaps, but is about 25 feet. So when you think about the ark, it was twice as wide, it was nine times as long, and it was twice as high. That's the space that is available inside the ark that Noah was to prepare so that safety might be given to those who would become the occupants. You can think of it in another way. A football field is 300 feet long, 160 feet wide. Imagine one and a half fields, half as wide, and you have a picture of what the ark was like. And then it had additional features. It was to have three stories, each of which would be 10 cubits high, 15 feet. Each of those decks were divided into various rooms. In verse 14, it tells us about that in chapter 6, and it literally means nests. Nests, places of safety. Probably each one of them of appropriate size for the individual animals to rest in. It was made of gopher wood. We don't know the exact nature of what that was today, although many have speculated that it was cypress wood, very impervious to being soaked by the waters that would be upon the earth. It was some type of dense, hard wood, and it was made waterproof and resistant to decay by impregnating it with pitch inside and outside. Verse 14 says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. It had a window. In verse 15, we're told of that. The Hebrew word means noon or midday. Uh, double light is actually a good uh, translation of it. Double light. It probably means literally an opening for daylight. So there was an opening in the ark for daylight, and most authorities, most men that you read that give consideration to this and have speculated and examined through the years have said that it was to consist of an 18-inch opening extending all around the ark's circumference near the roof that would provide light and ventilation for this ark. Supposedly, presumably, there would have been some kind of parapet that would keep out the rain. So try to get the picture in your mind of what this barge-like construction looked like in its completion. And then finally, the ark was to have a door in its side. And it's interesting, isn't it? Only one door causes us to think of John chapter 10, verse 9. I am the door. Jesus Christ. If any man believeth in me, he shall uh, be saved and enter in and go in and out and have pasture, have provision that comes from God. It makes me think of the little chorus. Let's see how many of you remember it. Sing it with me if you know it. One door, and only one, and yet its sides are two. 
inside and outside, on which side are you? One door and only one, and yet its sides are two. I'm on the inside, on which side are you? You see, God's provision, one door, enter in, go into this place of safety. There's nowhere else to go for that provision of safety but into the ark. And once those animals started streaming into the ark as they were brought by God to that place to be loaded upon this barge-like structure, there was nowhere else to go but further into the ark. God made provision. Now, there's one more observation that we need to make concerning it. The word for ark is not the word used later for ark of the covenant. People have often tried to compare the two in some way, but it's not the same word. It is a word used for the ark of bulrushes, in which Moses was hidden as a baby and recorded for us in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 3. So what we gather from this is that it was a very ancient word for a box meant to float on water. Very simple explanation that God gives to us. What about the capacity? What was the capacity of the ark? Now, I'm not going to rely on my own expertise, which is non-existent in this area, but I'm going to depend on others who have uh, studied this matter and who can, from a mathematical uh, construction, also tell us what the capacities were. Marine experts estimate that since the ark was built with a flat bottom, there was no waste space on the bow, the front of the ship or the stern, the rear of the ship. The figure was square on both ends, straight up on its sides. It would have had the displacement of about 43,000 tons. Now that's nearly equal to that of the ill-fated Titanic. The Titanic was 825 feet long, 93 feet wide, and it had a displacement of 46,000 tons. The three decks, the stories, were about 15 feet high each, and so the vessel had a capacity of 1,518,750 cubic feet. So again, I want you to simply get the picture in your mind of the size of the provision that God had made. Eight souls saved. Terrestrial animal life saved. But there was room for more. There was room for those who would occupy if they would believe the message that God had given I'm told that even allowing for the walls and walkways, there was at least 97,700 square feet, which is equivalent to 20 standard college basketball courts. It was the largest ship ever built until 1884 AD when the Italian vessel, the Ituria, was built. This barge-like structure, this ark, was nearly one-half the length of the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary was, was 1,018 feet long. And then think about the cargo capacity. The total animal population would not have exceeded 35,000 vertebrates. The average size would have been that of a sheep. A modern train of 150 boxcars could carry that number of sheep. And the ark had a carrying capacity of over 520 boxcars, 
or I am told, putting it in other terms, 1,300 standard 20-foot containers on a container ship. We're talking, folks, about a lot of space. And since about 240 sheep could be contained in that one stock car, you had a total capacity, if we're talking only sheep, of over 125,000 sheep that could have been carried in the ark. Now, you would have gone crazy with all the bah that was going on <laughs> in that vessel. Think about stability and durability. An author by the name of Frederick Philby writes in a book entitled The Flood Reconsidered, said, and I quote, the ark was according to the specifications laid down to be 300 cubits long by 50 cubits wide by 30 cubits high. The ratio of those numbers are very interesting. They obviously reflect an advanced knowledge of shipbuilding. The Babylonian account, which speaks of the ark as a cube, betrays complete ignorance. Such a vessel would spin slowly around, but the Bible ratios have nothing, leave nothing to be desired. I think it was Henry Morris who said it can be shown hydrodynamically that a gigantic box of such dimensions would be exceedingly stable, almost impossible to capsize. Even in a sea of gigantic waves, the ark could be tilted through any angle up to just short of 90 degrees and would immediately thereafter right itself. Further, it would tend to align itself parallel with the direction of major wave advance and thus be subject to minimum pitching most of the time. Let me read from just a couple of sources here that may add to these things, and you'll see why we're talking about the dimensions and all of this in just a few moments. By Archimedes' principle, the weight of a floating object is the weight of the fluid it displaces. The bottom of the arc had an area equal to its length times its width or 450 feet by 75 feet, equaling 33,750 square feet. The maximum volume of water displaced would have been this area multiplied by the draft of 22 and a half feet. That's how far the ship would sink into the water, fully loaded. 33,750 times 22 and a half feet, 700 59,375 feet. The density of water, of fresh water, is 62.4 pounds per foot. And the density of ocean water is close to this in value. This would make the maximum weight of water displaced equal to 759,353 by 62.4 47,385 pounds. Thus, the maximum weight of the fully loaded ark was about 47 million pounds, or about 24,000 tons. Let us assume that the weight of the ark itself and provender for the passengers made up 90% of this figure, and that only 10% of this weight consisted of people and animals. Thus, we have the weight of live cargo as 4.7 million pounds, or 2,400 tons. The average animal weighs less than 100 pounds. In fact, biologists class creatures weighing over 100 pounds as megafauna, Greek for large beasts. And yes, people are considered megafauna. <laughs> Let us cons conservatively suppose, however, that the average animal on the ark weighed 100 pounds. Thus, we have uh, a carrying capacity for the ark of 47,000 animals. Woodmurap, 
who is a noted creation scientist and has talked of many of these things, after an exhaustive survey concluded that the ark carried 15,750 animals, or about 16,000. This is about one-third of the carrying capacity maintained, uh, estimated above from buoyancy considerations. Clearly, the ark was not filled to capacity. Room remained for freedom of movement and living space during the flood year. Then he goes on to talk about the stability of the ark. Finally, in conclusion, he says, God supernaturally watched over the ark and its inhabitants, but he also designed the physical characteristics of the ark to harness nature's and natural forces so as to provide protection. How long did the flood last? Well, if we figure on a 30-day month, 360 days in a year, and we compare chapter 8, verse 4, with chapter 7 and verses 11 and 24, let's look at them for just a moment. Chapter 8, verse 4, the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. And in chapter 7, verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. Verse 24, and the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. And if we make the calculations, you discover, as others have, that the total duration of the flood was one year, 10 days, 370 days. During that year, Noah remained in the ark, and he was protected from the terrible water judgment that was outside and that was taking place as God destroyed all life from the earth. And it was during that time that we're told in chapter 7, verse 19, that the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and they reached a height of 15 cubits, 22 and a half feet, at least above the mountains. The draught of the ark, when fully loaded, was 22 and a half feet. So God made provision, not only in miraculously dealing with this, but in the natural aspect of what was taking place. And within the laws of nature, God provided protection. Now you're saying, oh, all right, I get it. It's a big thing. It's stable. It can hold a lot of cattle or sheep or people. It's a provision that God has made. Yeah, I get all that. But why in the world spend time going through statistics and talking about measurements and thinking about drought and all of these things that are a part of the process of what God did to preserve life? Why think about dimensions and capacity and stability? And the reason is to demonstrate the validity and reliability of this account in the scriptures, number one. How many times have you heard people in laughter talk about the story of Noah and a worldwide flood? Ah, they make up every excuse they can possibly think of that, nope, it never happened like that. That couldn't possibly be. Nothing of that nature could ever take place in this world as we know it, and yet God says otherwise. Another reason to show us this ark as a splendid type of Christ and his provision for all who will trust him 
think of this think of the similarities this was revealed in advance just as Christ was spoken of in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 there's going to be one who will come the seed of the woman and then we trace that throughout all the scriptures and we move through the Old Testament God revealing there's a there's a Redeemer coming there's one who will provide for you in the midst of your sin there is one who will bear the sins of many he will be the one who is the Redeemer and has provided for all peoples in the world just as that was true God revealed to Noah this is what I'm going to do and here's what I want you to do this is what you must prepare in order to pass through these waters safely the ark was also a provision against a day of certain judgment God didn't say I might destroy all life from the earth I might do these things that I'm telling you Noah no he said I will destroy I will wipe the earth clean of this population that has sinned so grievously against me so he speaks of provision against a day of certain judgment here's what I'm providing Noah the ark the ark of safety will you believe or not will you be on the inside of the door or on the outside many are going to be on the outside of that door but I'm making provision so that all may come in if they will a beautiful picture of what we have in Jesus Christ whosoever will may come I am the door he said I'm the one through whom you must come and then go in and out and find pasture but there's another this ark was of sufficient capacity for all who would come God didn't say okay I've got a number in mind and once that number is hit you're done he said this is open to all why else would Noah be preaching as a preacher of righteousness in the midst of all this and what would he be urging but to say look there's a flood coming there is judgment coming God is going to deal with this earth but he's made provision can we see the parallels with our own day and the judgment that God has promised yet again upon this earth and the destruction that will come and the wiping away of mankind but God says I have capacity for all whosoever will may come and then think of this there was not a drop of judgment water that entered the ark why well it was made seaworthy not only by its construction but by pitch within and without I am providing this to keep out the water pitch beautiful word it is the word kafar in Hebrew in almost every other instance in the Old Testament the word kafar is translated by the word atonement think of that God says I want you to pitch this within and without with pitch oh, okay I understand there's you need this bituminous material to keep out the water oh but there's more than that this is your provision the word atone is to cover with blood to make atonement to cover with blood without the shedding of blood there is no remission there's no provision apart from the shed blood of Jesus Christ for salvation your good works won't do it your church attendance won't do it your baptism won't do it your church membership won't do it 
nothing will do but the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I want you to pitch it within and without. What a beautiful picture. And just as that oily pitch protected the ark from the flood judgment, so it is that the blood of Christ protects the believer from the sin judgment. Because we are under God's judgment from Jesus Christ so the point is not simply to say wow big boat <laughs> the point is not to say yeah wow it's stable look look how well the dimensions have been put together it's not to cause amazement oh the capacity and and the maneuverability that didn't be that wasn't needed because God had constructed this just as he desired through Noah. No, it is to understand that God is the one who brings judgment and the judgment of sin is upon everyone who is born upon the face of this planet. But God has provided a way and not only did he provide a way in this instance with a divine judgment of a flood, worldwide flood, that covered even the tops of the highest mountains, but God has made a provision that men might come into his ark of safety. When you're in the ark, it's a place of salvation. It's a place of security. It's a place of separation. It's a place of communion. It's a place of anticipation. When you are in Christ, it is a place of salvation. It is a place of security. It is a place of separation. It is a place of communion. It is a place of anticipation. That's what we have in Jesus Christ. And that is what is pictured for us in this ark that God told Noah, prepare it, I'm making a way. <coughs> and all who will come in will be saved. They would have known physical safety you and I being in Christ know the redemptive safety and provision that God has made for us so when you think of the ark don't just think in terms of wow big stable capacity but think in terms of the picture that God gives to us of what he has provided for you, for me, for us, in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Pitched within and without the atoning blood of Jesus Christ on our behalf. What a delight to know him and to walk with him. I trust you do know him this morning. Not just in the sense of saying, oh yeah, I know about. But that you know him personally. It is only in that relationship of having trusted in him and received forgiveness of sin through his shed blood, redemption through him, that you can lay claim to the salvation and the security and the separation all of these things that God has provided, even in our communion with him, to walk with Jesus Christ, what a joy. And this morning, we are privileged to be able again to be reminded of our Lord's death and burial and resurrection. I'm going to ask the men to prepare and then gather here at the front if they would, but I have a few verses that I'd like to read for you 
from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. 